Welcome to Education Beat. I'm Ann Vasquez, CEO of EdSource. California is the first state to pass a law requiring all high school students to complete a semester-long course in ethnic studies that focuses on the history of groups that have been traditionally overlooked. High schools have to offer these courses starting in the 2025-26 school year, but some districts already offer ethnic studies courses and some are expanding the types of classes. Anaheim Union High School District has launched a first-of-its-kind class focused on the experiences and history of Korean Americans. A lot of Asian Americans, they might not know that part of their story of who they are today is connected to Latin American stories, uh, Black stories. It's, it's all intersected and connected. What are students learning in this class? And how does it fit into the overall context of California ethnic studies? Here is this week's Education Beat with host Sadie Stabley. Jeff Kim is a world history teacher in Anaheim Union High School District. In early 2020, one of his seventh grade students came up to him before class and expressed concern that she or her family might face anti-Asian violence because of this new virus in China, COVID-19. Jeff is Korean American. He'd experienced discrimination in his own life, but he wanted to reassure his student. I just said, you know what, I think, you know, we live here in California, I don't see, you know, that type of, of violence happening to uh, Asian Americans here in California. I just said that to her and I gave her the wrong information. Anti-Asian hate crimes doubled in California in 2020 compared with a prior year. In Orange County, where Jeff teaches, the number of hate incidents against Asian Americans jumped 1,800 percent in 2020, according to the annual Orange County Hate Crime Report more and more students were afraid. From that one student became many students uh, being called names or, you know, uh, COVID-19 or people coughing, uh, things like that. And then uh, it wasn't just our school, but other schools, students were very fearful of this. News of Asian American spa workers in Georgia who were killed in a shooting rampage was a turning point for Jeff. So a lot of people were responding to the hate with, uh, I think, fear and anger. But I thought, how can I respond with love and wisdom? In this situation where there's a surge in anti-Asian racism or COVID-19, I thought, you know what, if I could help students to know and tell their own stories of resilience, that would be a gift, you know, that would make a difference. This is Education Beat, getting to the heart of California schools. I'm Zadie Stavely. This week, a high school Korean-American studies class aims to build empathy in the wake of anti-Asian hate. After seeing all the anti-Asian hate crimes in the news and all the concerns among his students, Jeff Kim decided to design a Korean-American ethnic studies course. I said, you know what, a part of the reason why this is happening is because um, I think when they see somebody that looks like me, second generation Korean American, or my children who are third generation Korean American, uh, they might think um, China. There's nothing wrong with China or anything like that, but I'm not Chinese, I'm an American, you know, and, and I have a great uh, American story. And uh, I, I think uh, instead what they have are stereotypes, stereotypes of like, it could be the model minority, like look at these people who are taking uh, and achieving, and it creates a further wedge between groups. Mm -hmm. It could be the stereotype of yellow peril. There's something mm -hmm. dangerous about those people. Yeah. Or the stereotype of persistent foreigner. Like, it doesn't matter how long you've been in this country. If you look Asian American, uh, then you're not an American, really. So a lot of people actually do know a lot about Asian Americans. But if I were to ask, could you name one here that made a difference for America? Many would struggle with that. So that's why I, I want to create this course so that students could know their story, tell their story, uh, listen to one another's stories with empathy and respect, and do something good with their story. My colleague Emma Gallegos wrote about Jeff's class for EdSource. Hi, Emma. Hi, Zadie. So Emma, what makes this program unique? Um, there's a couple things about it that are unique. The main thing is that this is the first Korean American studies program that's aimed specifically at K-12 or high school. So, you know, there have been Asian American studies programs and there are Korean American studies programs um, aimed at college students, but this is the first one that's coming to the high school level. 
Why is that important? So this program is in Anaheim, which is in Orange County. And Southern California is really a hotspot of um, Korean migration. And so there's quite a few, there's a lot of scholarship going on in the area, but there's also just a lot of students who are, a lot of them are first and second generation Korean students. And, you know, they have not seen themselves reflected in the curriculum at all. Um, I had one student who I talked to who said that, her mom um, was born in Korea and immigrated here. And she was talking to her mother and she said that she was really excited that her daughter was not just learning about it, but being able to learn about it in a school and academic setting. And her mom even said this is something that she wished she could have received because she was only getting it at home. So seeing the stories about Korean Americans, actually being able to learn about them in school and what they've achieved is um, really, really important for students and their families. To design the course, Jeff realized he needed some help. So he turned to scholars of Korean American history, many of whom are based in Southern California. The course begins with lessons focused on the students themselves and their families' own stories. Many of them don't even know their own Asian American story, their Korean American story. Uh, They'll be able to talk to their parents, do oral histories. Sometimes, um, once again, parents haven't had the chance to uh, tell these stories because uh, there's a language barrier, cultural barrier, But if I make it a class assignment, (laughs) the students are much more inclined to ask and the parents are much more inclined to want to tell their story. And then when they hear their parents' story, before it might have been the source of, oh, shame, like my parents don't speak English well or my parents can't this, but they'll see it as a story of resilience. Wow, they overcame this and they overcame this and they overcame this. They survived this and they can be proud of their own story, which is a great American story, actually. Some of Jeff's students presented on their personal stories and hopes for the class in a YouTube video he shared with us. Here's Savannah Hokut. When I was little, my mom used to play uh, K-pop a lot, specifically like 21 and Girls' Generation, and would say, oh yeah, you're Korean too. And I was like, what? And I was really confused. And I was like, so what what are they talking about? And she wouldn't know, I wouldn't know, because her mom never taught her how to speak Korean. And thus, you know, I never learned. But nonetheless, their music... Um, helped me and my mom form a strong bond. After learning about their own histories, the students delve deeper into Korean-American history, which many of the students are excited about. Here's Celine Park. I had always considered my Korean background and kind of its history as a concept that's completely different and separate from American history, almost like they were in two completely different worlds. So Emma, what did students tell you about the course so far? Yeah, it's really early in the course, but these students were really excited. Um, and they're they're all just taking this for fun at this point. It is not a requirement. There will be an ethnic studies requirement in a couple of years, but they were just excited to learn about their own history or, um, you know, not all of them are Korean American. They're excited to just learn about another culture, too. So I think, you know, a lot of students um, at that high school age are starting to think about themselves and their own identity and where they fit in and, this is really meaningful for them. And not not only Korean-American students, right? Right. That's right. Yeah. And so, um, again, this piece of connecting different types of history together, there was an early part of a lesson on uh, stereotypes and what they can do or how they affect a community. And, you know, so recently, Asian-Americans have been experiencing quite a lot of discrimination, hate crime. I mean, horrible, horrible things happening in the wake of the pandemic. And there was also a point of comparison with one of the students um, who I spoke with, Karina Soliman, um, and she talked to her father about what it was like post 9-11. And so he's Arab American. And so anyone who is Arab American after 9-11 was experiencing, you know, quite a bit of discrimination, hate crime. So there are different points of connection and totally different communities, which was really interesting for the students to discuss. What kinds of things are in the course? Like, can you tell us some of the lessons that they told you about? Yeah. So the curriculum spans from the 19th century when the first wave of um, immigrants came all the way to K-pop now. So it covers um, early immigration and then also just a wave that happened after 1965 when immigration laws change and they were allowing in Asian Americans um, in greater numbers for the first time. And, you know, it also covered, you know, why Koreans were coming over and settling. And it even includes um, one of the big lessons is on the Los Angeles civil uprising of 1992. And 
a lot of people think about it as a kind of black, white, Rodney King. But this is a huge event for Koreans and also for Korean American identity. Can you say a little bit more about that? Why why was the uprising in 1982 important for the Korean American community? Yeah, so it was prompted by um, the Rodney King verdict. And there were um, riots throughout Los Angeles. Um, but Koreatown was one of the hardest hit areas. Um, and there was quite a bit of tension between the Black and Korean community. And there was also quite a bit of media around this time that inflamed those tensions. And, you know, there were a lot of Korean Americans who settled in Los Angeles, opened up shops. And um, a lot of them thought of themselves as just immigrants who'd come over, opened up a shop, they were making money. And then in 1992, they found themselves in the middle of a lot of chaos and also scapegoated for a lot of the racial tension at that time. You know, so I, I talked to a Korean American scholar who said that this really became a turning point where the Korean American community actually started thinking themselves actually as Americans, not just people who had just recently come over, opened up a shop and were making money and not really a part of this American story. And, I, you know, I spoke to some scholars who said this is when a lot of contemporary Korean American identity is formed, the way that they think about themselves, not just as um, people who are from Korea, but people who are also, you know, really Americans and Korean Americans. So there, there's quite a bit covered throughout the course. And there's, there's also a big emphasis on um, important people in history. Jeff calls this looking at Korean American stories of resilience. Like if I were to say, is Martin Luther King's story a story of resilience? Uh, all of us would say, oh, yes, I'm so thankful for that story. It contributes to the American story and also to my Korean American story. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a story that comes out of the Black community, but it's not just a Black story. It's a American story, right? Um, or if we go to Sylvia Mendez and the Mendez versus Westminster family mm-hmm. uh, who helped pave the way to 1954, Brown versus Board, Board of Education desegregating schools. That's a great Latino-Hispanic story, but it's not just a great Latino-Hispanic story. It's a great American story. So what are the great Korean American stories that have contributed to not just Korean Americans, but all Americans? One of those people is Sammy Lee. Sammy Lee was an Olympic gold medal winning Olympic diver. And but when he was growing up in Southern California, I believe it was in Pasadena, he was barred from um, pools. Pools were segregated at that time. That's an interesting piece of history to talk about because you know, Jeff Kim said, when you learn about a very specific slice of history, it also connects you with other pieces of history. So obviously, Asian Americans were not the only ones who were barred from pools. Obviously, anyone who is not white was also barred. So, um, you know, students coming into this course, they can learn about how it connects with their own history, whether or not they're Korean American or not. And also, uh, then that connects, of course, to the civil rights movements and how that paves the way, not just for uh, Black Americans, but for all Americans, including Korean Americans. So I think a lot of Asian Americans, they might not know that part of their story, like uh, of who they are today is connected to um, Latin American stories, uh, Black stories. It's, it's all intersected and connected. Later on in the course, students are expected to participate in a civic project, basically acting on something they learned about. So after they've learned all these Korean American stories of resilience, um, maybe there's going to be something in them. Like, you know what? I want to be like Dosa I want to be like Dr. Sam Lee. I want to be like Colonel Yungo Kim. They're going to think of something that they want to do. I'm going to support them. So whether it could be a Korean American agency, it could be an Asian American agency, it could be a faith-based organization, it could be their polit- local politicians. The civic participation has also um, earned the notice of the California Asian American and Pacific Islander Legislative Caucus, um, they said. Um, so it was Assembly Member Evan Lowe and Senator Dave Min praised the course for allowing students to foster collaborations and partnerships with Asian American organizations. And this is something the students also talked about being excited about. And they get to you know, pick something that's meaningful and work on that. Emma, how does this course fit into the sort of the broader context of ethnic studies in California right now? In two years, all high school students will be required to take an ethnic studies course. You know, there's an ethnic studies model that goes through um, all the different ethnicities. So um, Black students, Latino, Native American, Asian American, you know, Korean American scholars have really been pushing for there to be um, more inclusion of Korean American studies, not just in a course like this, but across the board. So there wasn't anything about Korean Americans in that original model curriculum. 
why did California make this a requirement? I mean, I know it's not in, in force yet, but why did California legislators decide to make ethnic studies a requirement? Like, how does it help students? You know, I know that there has been research on how it can help students in a number of different ways. So that students come in, they can feel more connected to their communities. There's also some research just about how it can actually help the racial relations in a school, which is something that sometimes you hear that there's this fear that ethnic studies will turn students against each other or make them feel bad. And, you know, this is not what you've been hearing out of the schools who've been doing it, that it actually helps um, kind of knit the school together because students know their history, where they're coming from. So I think that's one of the biggest things. Um, and also just this idea of having a more complete view of history. So if you're only looking at history from one lens or another, you're not getting really the full the full view. Do you think that this class can tell us something about the power of ethnic studies overall? I, I definitely think so. And I heard it a lot when I was talking to the students. One of them um, said, you know, very explicitly without me even bringing it up, she just said, teachers need to know that we need this kind of course. You know, she was really forceful about it. She said, we need this and we need this now. We can't wait till college. And, you know, she said, you know, a lot of students aren't even going to go to college and they're not going to be able to get this experience. Um, and, you know, this is something that I heard over and over again. So I also heard it from one of the scholars who teaches it at the college level. And he said, you know, students are coming in with these just rudimentary ideas about ethnic studies. And he just really felt it's a shame that people come in and don't know anything about their own past, their own history. They haven't done any thinking about it. And they're they're already in college. That He said, that's just too late. Jeff is hopeful that his students will take what they learn in his class and build on that out in the community. Spread the word, so to speak. My hope is that they're not just going to leave as students. They're going to leave as almost like as diversity, equity, inclusion consultants. So the strategies that I use to help them know and tell their own story, I want them to take that and then go to like different places so that they can also help other communities. And once again, a lot of this is not necessarily Korean American states. It's just an approach that can apply for, you know, anyone. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Education Beat, getting to the heart of California schools, a production of EdSource. You can find Emma's story at edsource.org. Our producer is Kobe McDonald. Special thanks to our guests, Jeff Kim and Emma Gallegos. Our CEO is Anne Vasquez. Our theme music is from Blue Dot Sessions. This episode was brought to you by the Stewart Foundation. I'm Zadie Stavely. Join us next week and subscribe so you won't miss an episode.